On December 7, 1862, Confederate forces under the command of Thomas Hindman marched against a Union force in northwestern Arkansas. Determined to shift the tide of the war in this far western part of the conflict, Hindman hoped to drive those Union forces out of Arkansas for good. On the other side was a Union division under the command of General James Blunt, and the two armies would meet outside the small town of Prairie Grove, Arkansas. Though far from one of the most famous battles of the war, the Battle of Prairie Grove had significant consequences for the war west of the Mississippi. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Most of the more famous battles of the U.S. Civil War took place east of the Mississippi, while the most famous western campaign was General Grant's along the Mississippi River, which culminated in the siege at Vicksburg. Fighting west of the Mississippi is considered part of a different theater, the Trans-Mississippi Theater, which covers most of the western United States, with the exception of the Pacific Coast. While not as seriously studied, the theater of war was not without serious fighting, especially over Missouri, a slave state which remained in Union hands for the duration of the war. On January 3, 1861, Claiborne Fox Jackson assumed the governorship of Missouri. He ran as a Democrat, supporting Stephen Douglas' anti-secession platform. However, Jackson immediately began working surreptitiously for the state's secession. Already, South Carolina had seceded, and six days later it would be followed by Mississippi. On February 8th, 7th, secessionist states agreed to the provisional constitution of the Confederate states. Jackson had called for a state convention to decide the issue of secession, but the delegates refused, 98 to 1. Jackson declared that the state would remain an armed neutral, refusing to provide arms or soldiers to either side. When Lincoln called for the states to provide soldiers for the war effort, Jackson answered that your requisition, in my judgment, is illegal, unconstitutional, and revolutionary in its object, inhuman and diabolical, and cannot be complied with. Not one man will the state of Missouri furnish to carry on an unholy crusade. The governor was simultaneously hoping to stage a military coup to seize Missouri for the Confederacy, speaking to President Jefferson Davis about a plan to seize the U.S. arsenal at St. Louis. Still professing neutrality, he was actively asking for a Confederate invasion of the state and promised his Missouri Guard would support it. Instead, the Union forces moved, seizing Jefferson City on June 13th. Confederate forces won victories at several minor battles, but the Union forces proved to be too great, driving the pro-Confederate forces into Arkansas. In March of 1862, the Confederacy attempted a campaign to push the Union out of Arkansas, but was defeated at the Battle of Pea Ridge. For a time, that defeat seemed to end Confederate efforts to control northern Arkansas or counterattack in Missouri. Union and Confederate forces both were moved east of the Mississippi. Union forces in Missouri were dealing with an intense guerrilla campaign, unable to press south. The Army of the Frontier was formed to defend southwest Missouri in October. On November 20th, John Schofield was forced by medical issues to give up command of the Army of the Frontier, and command passed to Brigadier General James G. Blunt, then in command of one of the Army's three divisions. At that time, the Army was split, with Blunt's division in Arkansas, while the remaining two divisions were positioned in Missouri at Wilson's Creek. Blunt was a physician who was involved in the anti-slavery forces in Kansas during the fighting called Bleeding Kansas prior to the war. Blunt's unit was unique in 1862. Called the Kansas Division, it was made up mostly of Kansans, but also included the first two African-American regiments raised for the Union, the 1st and 2nd Kansas, as well as three regiments of Native Americans. In August of 1862, Confederate General Thomas C. Hinman had been ordered to organize an army in Arkansas that could capture Missouri. Hinman had previously been in command of the entire Trans-Mississippi until his efforts to invigorate the forces there aroused political opposition. Hinman was from a fairly wealthy southern family, which settled in Mississippi, and had served during the Mexican-American War, reaching the rank of lieutenant but not participating in any major action. He was elected as a U.S. representative for Arkansas in 1858, was a vocal firebrand and secessionist. He was replaced by Theophilus Granny Holmes. Hinman got a field command and began recruiting what would become Hinman's Legion. His work was nothing short of a miracle. In an area low on troops and weapons, he assembled a patchwork but significant force that could threaten the Union's hold in Missouri, and in only two months. Historian William Shea called it an achievement without parallel in the Civil War. Prior to the battle, there was significant maneuvering on the part of both armies. Hinman got far enough into Missouri to threaten Springfield, but lost his chance when Granny Holmes recalled him to Little Rock. Hinman's legion remained in Missouri, but found itself seriously outmaneuvered and had to withdraw. Blunt's division came into contract with Confederate cavalry in early November at Cane Hill. Though quickly chased off, Hinman sent a new force of around 2,000 men to occupy the hill. When Blunt learned of it, he immediately set about attacking the inferior force. In addition to outnumbering the Confederates, his own force consisting of about 5,000 men, the Confederate force had only six cannons to Blunt's 30, and the Union force was much better equipped. 
The short battle on November 28th resulted in the Confederate force being chased off. To attack the force at Cane Hill, Blunt had further separated himself from the two Missouri divisions, and Hinman saw an opportunity. Hinman moved his entire force, some 11,000 men, to attack Blunt's while he was isolated. Blunt learned of Hinman's plans by December 2nd and sent telegraphs reporting the situation and requesting reinforcements. Hinman hoped to oppose Blunt and outmaneuver him, hoping to attack with superior numbers, his force both in the front and at his flanks. Blunt had his troops on high alert as he waited for Hinman's army. The two Missouri divisions, under the command of Francis J. Heron, began marching immediately upon receipt of Blunt's telegraph for help, on an epic of human endurance. The two divisions marched over 100 miles in frigid winter weather, averaging 30 miles a day. According to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, the average generally was between 8 and 13 miles a day. Hinman had hoped to strike as quickly as possible, but bad weather delayed his troops so that he wasn't ready to attack until December 7th. December 6th saw the first skirmishes between cavalry units. Realizing that Heron's force was near, Hinman changed his plans on the eve of December 7th, planning to hurry north and attack Heron's divisions first before swinging around to attack Blunt's division. Hinman's troops began moving at 4 a.m. on the 7th. Ahead of the main body, 2,000 Confederate cavalry met and routed several regiments of Union cavalry near Prairie Grove, giving chase across the Illinois River until they met with advanced elements of Heron's divisions. Heron pressed on, and the Confederate cavalry withdrew. When Hinman's first division of 6,300 men reached Prairie Grove, he began to have doubts about his plan. Instead of moving to attack Heron, Hinman ordered the division to take a defensive position against the possible arrival of Blunt's division. The next division of about 3,200 arrived and took up a defensive position as well. Meanwhile, Blunt's scouts had detected Hinman's maneuver early in the morning, but the message failed to reach Blunt, who didn't begin marching until 10 a.m. Meaning to reach Prairie Grove, the front brigade erred on its destination, turning on a road towards Rhea's Mill. Though the mistake cost Blunt time, it allowed his division to approach Prairie Grove by the least defended route. By 2.30 p.m., his division was on the march from Rhea's Mill to Prairie Grove, where the roar of cannon could already be heard. Heron's divisions had reached Prairie Grove in the morning, began an artillery bombardment on the high ground where Hinman's army waited. The Confederate artillery lacked the range to effectively return fire and was too low on ammunition to keep up a sustained fire. Heron ordered his two brigades to attack the Confederate line. Fighting fell mostly on the 20th Wisconsin and 19th Iowa regiments, which overran a Confederate artillery battery but were repulsed by a counterattack. The two regiments suffered casualties of about 50%. A member of the 19th Iowa wrote that the battle had raged before with fury. Now it was terrific, and until dark, the battle raged with all its terror. More Union regiments struck the same part of the line, with the 37th Illinois securing the Confederate battery at second time. John Black of the 37th would be awarded a Medal of Honor for leading the attack, which managed to capture another Confederate battery despite Black being wounded in the arm in the action. His brother would be awarded a Medal of Honor for actions at the earlier Battle of Pea Ridge, making the Black brothers the first pair of siblings to earn Medals of Honor. His brother, William Black, described the counterattack at Borden House, writing that the rebels came down like a cloud into the valley in pursuit. But just as they withdrew, they repulsed the counterattack with Union artillery. We had the rebels now, just where we'd always wanted them, on level clear ground, and we felt now was an hour of vengeance. At 3.15, Blunt arrived at the battle with his staff, his division close behind. Blunt opened fire first with his artillery, and the Confederate line adjusted to face the new threat. Blunt's first assault by the 20th Iowa and the 1st Indian Home Guard was repulsed, and a series of attacks and counterattacks followed. The air thick with bullets. The situation became somewhat dire when around a thousand Federal troops became separated from the line. A Confederate counterattack by three times as many soldiers nearly overran the Union troops. Blunt's howitzers were able to blunt the charge, but the withdrawal was costly. Hinman has been criticized for leaving the actual battle command to his subordinates, and as evening came before 5 p.m., a Confederate brigade commander, Mosby Parsons, a native Missourian, made a decision. He determined to charge the enemy with bayonet. Parsons hoped to make a decisive attack and end the battle. Rushing as dark fell, his charge was confused, failed to come full to bear. Still, his men charged a Union line. It was then pandemonium broke loose, wrote a Kansan infantryman. The Federal artillery loosed infernal contents of grape and canister shot, followed by infantry volleys, which shredded Parsons' lead units. Nearly half would be wounded or killed. It was the Confederates' last counterattack. While the fighting had been inconclusive, Hinman now faced an almost even Union force, which was further being reinforced by troops that were trickling in after Heron's force march. There were no reinforcements for him, and his units were running low on ammunition and food. Another day of fighting would spell catastrophe for his legion. Still, he announced that at dark the battle closed, leaving us masters of every foot of the ground on which it was fought. Hinman ordered his men to withdraw. Confederate soldiers were dismayed. One Arkansan wrote that they retreated with mortification from a field gallantly won, 
Another wrote that we have whipped the foe, we are being told to retreat anyway. Others were perhaps more realistic, with one admitting that had we remained one day longer, we would have nearly starved. Pursuing Union cavalry reported that the Confederates were pulling bark off of trees to eat, and that grapevines of two or three inches in diameter were gnawed clear off. Demoralized, the Confederate forces suffered seriously from desertions, and were forced to leave their wounded and dead. Leaving them was not an easy choice. The area was full of feral hogs, so-called razorbacks, and the threat was so serious that they left the wounded in groups with loaded revolvers, surrounded the piled dead with fence rails. Some of the Federal troops, unfamiliar with the threat, dubbed them slaughter pens. Compared to the major battles of the war, the casualties in the Battle of Prairie Grove were relatively light, with the Union reporting 175 dead, 813 wounded, and 263 missing, to the Confederates 164 dead, 817 wounded, and 336 missing. But the battle did represent the, the last serious Confederate threat to Union control over northern Arkansas and Missouri, although Blunt's force would fight one more small battle, defeating the Confederates in the Battle of Van Buren later in the month. The battle was significant for a couple of reasons. It ended Confederate hopes for control of Missouri, and it showed the precarious position of the Confederate armies at that point. The Confederates were barely able to field effective forces in Arkansas when they were fighting already on so many fronts. And the Trans-Mississippi Theater would essentially be cut off with the successful conclusion of Grant's Vicksburg campaign, leaving some 30,000 Confederate troops stranded. Be sure and join us in the History Guy Guild at thehistoryguyguild.locals.com. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguy.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.